Hello, welcome to 26.1 AI Podcast. Today, we're proud to flex some Husky pride. We have a faculty member from the University of Washington joining us. Dr. David Beck is the eScience Institute Director of Research and Education. Welcome, David. Welcome, David, to our show. Uh, so a little bit, just, yeah, so happy to have you here. Real honor to have you here today. A little bit about your background for the audience. Uh, okay, so uh, I many many years ago, if you go back to the um, '90s, I was uh, doing computer science. So I was um, getting an undergrad in computer science, and oh boy, at that time, you know, looked at career options and um, and wasn't excited about them as I was about what I was doing in the chemistry and biology classes that I was taking, and. Um, I went to Drexel as an undergrad and we had this co-op program. So you had to go out and work at a company, um, and, and get some experience and it didn't have to be a company. It turned out working in a science lab was fine. And so I went to a cancer research center and just fell in love with biology and chemistry and the application of computer science thereof. And everything kind of took off from there. I went to grad school and, um, did a postdoc, became a faculty member, and all of it was based on this idea that you don't do computer science in a vacuum, that really the point of computer science is to apply it to something. And mm -hmm. I love biology and chemistry and want to save the world. And it seemed like all of that came together in the sort of the perfect storm. So have you saved the world yet? <laughs> you, <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> You know what? We're making progress every day. Um, uh, but yeah, I think there's always more work to be done. Yeah. And then, like you, you also have a research center effort, uh, Don mentioned to me. So what's that all about? Uh, so the eScience Institute. Uh, so this yeah. is, yeah, if you put your way back hat on to 2008 or so, um, you know, I think I think the word that everybody was, or the words that everybody was using then, was big data. So it's big data, this, big data, that, and um, the challenge in science and engineering at that time in 2008 um, wasn't necessarily generating big data, right? If you um, you had um, in in biology, for example, gene sequencers were kind of hitting their stride. So that was kind of the rollover point where it became possible for mere mortals to purchase a gene seeker gene sequence and then kind of, you know, um, uh, just run it and, and not have constant interaction. So it became possible to generate lots of genomics data roughly around that time. Uh, you know, astronomers had a set of surveys, tel telescopes, and the Sloan Digital si Sky Survey. Um, had telescopes every night all over the world collecting uh, images and oceanography. We're instrumenting like the Pacific Ocean. Um, where, where, where was Twitter in 2008? I think it was coming on board. Um, so you had all of these areas of science and engineering becoming data rich instantly. And so for us, it wasn't so much about the big, about getting big data. It was what do you do with it? And um, I think that really led us to the evolution in 2008, 2009, of we need to do something more than just collect data. We need to extract knowledge and um, useful, actionable information from it. And, and at that time, uh, the eScience Institute was created at the University of Washington. I think, you know, this is the problem when you're ahead of the curve. Um, you occasionally choose, choose names that, um, <laughs> that uh, maybe uh, don't resonate um, a decade later in the same way that they did. So uh, the eScience Institute has become the Data Science Institute of the University of Washington. And today, um, it's not just science and engineering. It's um, uh, digital humanities, uh, the arts, uh, in addition to science and engineering and medicine. And it's, um, I think the eScience Institute is a really wonderful place for somebody like me who is a lifelong learner because we serve all of these places across campus and outside of campus, too. Um, and so I constantly get to get learning new things and thinking about new things and trying to find new ways to solve problems. Oh, and to take a problem that we solved, say, in oceanography and use it to solve a problem in chemical engineering, for example, and um, thinking about how to cross-fertilize uh, concepts, maybe in the same way that computer science was this cross-fertilization engine going back into the 70s and the 80s. David, you had mentioned 
earlier, you're really excited about the inclusion aspect of e-science and what you're seeing with um, folks across many disciplines, for example, the humanities adapting computational approaches. Maybe you go into that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there, I think we're all painfully aware of um, in, in computational sciences and all the fields that that touches that, that there is this um, uh, sort of a lack of, you know, I'll be honest that there's a lack of diversity in those spaces and it's, it's getting better for sure. Um, but one of the things that's been so wonderful for me and so exciting for me to see is that um, because data science is so applied and you can see the impact immediately and you can apply this to social problems that have daily impact on people, that we're able to see that folks who otherwise might have been turned off by computing generally, because they see the immediate impact of things like data science being applied to problems that exist in their communities, in, in their daily lives, that we're seeing an increase in participation in computing generally. Um, a lot of it enabled by the application of data science to social problems, for example. Um, and so that's really exciting to me. And I, and I hope that, you know, as that goes on, we see this diversity and this um, broadened participation and inclusion really permeate and spread beyond the social sciences and beyond the digital humanities and arts. And uh, so I'm just super excited about that and the potential for um, where that can go. How, how much of uh, what you've seen in that interdisciplinary sharing of computation affects the headlines we're seeing today, do you think? <laughs> since since I'm seeing a lot of um, data-centered stories now, and somebody's yeah. doing that work. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... If I can, if I can put together sort of current headlines with current data science methods in one shot, I think, you know, there's a lot of really exciting work that's being done around um, uh, tagging disinformation, for example, um, through the use of data science methods. And it, you know, the UW has the Center for Informed uh, um, Public, um, but the eScience Institute just had our Data Science for Social Good program finish in the summer. Um, and one of the projects there was um, we're looking at disinformation. And so if you feed a body of text, say an article uh, from a news site or Facebook or wherever um, to an algorithm, can it give you an estimate of whether something is disinformation or not? And so I think, you know, tools like that, I think, are very timely um, and very useful for folks. Uh, so I think I think I kind of answered your question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that as these things become more available, and this is a question I tend to ask a lot of people on our podcast, is the understanding of prediction also scaling into secular society? That people, do people understand prediction out there right now better? I'm going to go out on a limb and say that it's opaque to many people. Um, if they had a better understanding of maybe some of the methodological concerns, um, then we wouldn't be so open as a society, so ready as a society to accept things like, um, uh, you know, facial recognition software. Um, I think, yeah, and and the the role of artificial intelligence in banking and things like this. That there there are so many. If 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 there was better broad education about data science methods and and the role, say, of machine learning and artificial intelligence that people would be aware of some of the pitfalls and maybe um, pay more attention to um, some of the ways that uh, systemic um, issues could be perpetuated by the misapplication of these techniques. Um, and then you know, talk a bit more about that, um, you know, uh, stomatic type situations. Like, can, I mean, are they wrong to, to be somewhat afraid of, of some of it? I mean, and I, I bring this up every time. What are, is there any precautionary tale about AI and machine learning? Uh, yeah, there is one that that I think really spoke to me when I heard about it. The New York City and Taxi, the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, the TLC, I think that's what it's called, um, released a data set of. Um, trip records uh, tied to specific, specific medallions. So these are the essentially the, the thing that's given to a, a taxi driver that's, or to a car, actually, to a vehicle that says they can drive. And uh, so the, the New York City TLC released this data set of 
um, where drivers were, the trips they made, and they didn't identify any individual driver. Um, but from the patterns in those records themselves, you could identify particular aspects. So for example, if you saw a vehicle that was parked by the side of the road um, at a particular time during the day, say during prayer time, um, you could have a pretty good indication that a driver was of a particular um, faith, right? Mm -hmm. That they're uh, maybe they were doing their daily prayers at that time. And so I think we want to be really thoughtful and careful about um, releasing data um, and, and the implications for how those data can be misused and the algorithms that can be misused for them. On the flip side, we talked just, uh, what, seconds ago about reuse and open software, and that certainly applies to open data. So I think there is this tension that is difficult to resolve between the things that we can do with data as a society, like um, you know, improve uh, health outcomes for individuals, solve problems in the environment, uh, uncover vote dilution or um, disinformation. There's a tension between all these positive things that we can do and the potential harm that could be caused because the data themselves could be. Yeah, this is a widely used data set, by the way. We use it with our machine learning education all the time, uh, all the time. It's a very commonly referenced, and I'm surprised a bit that even there, there's some chance for misuse. It seems like it's everywhere, right? Um, I think you have to be very cautious of it. I think, you know, I, it is everywhere. Um, again, this comes back to the idea of education, right? So, uh, you know, it used to be that that uh, we would teach people, you know, how to consume the news. Like, this is a thing. I mean, my, my kids still do this in school, right? How to be a good news consumer. Um, but I think we need to think about that. We need to teach sort of this broad data science or data or machine learning or artificial intelligence. We need to see some broad data thinking literacy um, because then it becomes much easier for people to say, hmm, well, you know, I, I read about this one technique that can be used to, uh, you know, identify individuals from time series data of X, right? And then, you know, as consumers or people that are actually, we're not actually the consumers, we're the data generators, we can think a little bit about how could these data be used? Um, so I think there's a lot of literacy that can be driven into education, probably K through 12 education in this space as well. Well, even after that, I think I had spoken with a, um, an aspiring startup founder explaining why everybody wants an app on your phone and how much data that generates. Mm -hmm. And for in this purpose, for a startup founder trying to gain adoption, generate um, their growth metrics, they want that data to re-engage and drive usage of the app. But this person is very sophisticated and um, had a business degree from a very uh, distinguished school, didn't understand that. How many people know how much data is being collected by these apps? Yeah, and I think another thing to, to drill on, and I think about network neutrality and things like that is, uh, I think a TikTok actually. So Triller is a competitor with a group of friends of mine here in LA, but they're saying now because this is a Chinese ran organization that publishes TikTok, which is a popular social media, that it should be banned in the US. Um, but on the other hand, I thought we were supposed to be a free society, you know, and not be doing that. <laughs> I, I think we should own our data, don't get me wrong, but I also don't think we should dictate what people install on their phones. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a really challenging issue, isn't it? You know, it. I, I'm curious why, uh, you know, the app stores could tell you a lot about what data is collected by an app that you install on your phone. Like, I'm sure that they have that. Um, why don't they provide that? Well, if you told a user what data um, something was collected, you might not install it on your phone, and then the app store wouldn't get their cut. And, uh, so I think it's a really complex, you know, um, ecosystem in terms of the players that are involved and the varying competing interests. And it's, um, yeah, there's no easy solution to this. So I imagine you get <laughs> So I imagine you get insights of all, all sorts of uh, different people at different levels at your position. I mean, everything from students to other professors to 
just about every like cross section here and everyone's at a different level with acceptance of this technology. Is there any common thread that we're seeing today that everyone pretty much understands regarding AI and machine learning? Ooh, um, common thread that they all understand. I see. Um, well, I think the the short answer is potential. Um, so I deal a lot with graduate students and, and as you mentioned, faculty. And um, you get to be a graduate student working in, on, on some area, applying data science because you believe in the potential, right? Um, you know, most folks will get an undergraduate degree and that doesn't necessarily mean that they've engaged in their education. But if you get to the graduate level, you're there because you want to be there. And so when they're looking for something like the reason that folks are getting into data science or, or ML, machine learning, is they see the potential to create change. And um, that I think is the one thing that I don't even have to like the first day of class, I don't have to say anything and I could survey everybody and they would see that there's potential to create change. And generally people are in that room because they wanna create change in their area. They wanna design the next battery that will um, not explode when it gets too hot. Um, they want to come up with a, a better pharmaceutical to treat cancer. Um, so they're all in that room because there's something that's driving them and motivating them to be there. And I think that there is this deep belief that there's uh, a, a promise and potential of applying data science methods that will help them achieve that change that they want to see. Uh, and so I think that's the one, I, I know it sounds like a little cheesy answer, but that's the one thing that everybody gets is the potential for, for, for both good and bad, probably. Yeah, it's not it's not cheesy. I think that it also puts an enormous amount of stress on you to provide that education. I imagine. Do you? What are the challenges you run into with, you know? Teaching? Well, I would disagree that it creates. Uh, what did you say? Stress. Um, it's one of. <laughs> well, I imagine. I mean, at least there's a responsibility that I don't know. stress. Well, so the uh, thing is that I I love it because there is that moment when um, folks transition between. Uh, the uh, knowing that they can solve a problem between between saying I, I want to predict um, you know which which uh, small molecule which of these ten to the six small molecules out there is going to be most drug like right and when they make that transition from understanding that there is potential to create an algorithm to or a model to predict which ones are going to be most pharmaceutical like. Uh, and actually achieve that result. When you see that uh, that step function change in their level of capability of understanding, it makes it all worthwhile. Um, I guess in terms of some of the biggest challenges is that um, you know it that that statistics I think in the undergraduate education is largely underserved. And you know, let's be honest that a lot of machine learning and and AI methods have a basis in statistics, or at least interpreting their results has a strong um, basis in statistics. And so I think one of the, the struggles for me is to every year teach that intro to statistics all over again. Um, and I really feel like we could be doing a better job regardless of where you're getting an undergraduate education. And I don't mean the institution, I mean, I mean like what area of undergraduate um, uh, education you get, whether it's uh, American Ethnic Studies or it's um, Chemical Engineering that there's more statistics um, education that we could be pro providing to folks. So that's probably are, the, are the, the biggest thing yeah. I would think that we could improve. Are, are the sociologists or economists that you work with better prepared in terms of understanding statistics or have a firmer grounding in it? You know, that's, that's a great question. And uh, in order to do social science well, you do have to think a lot about experimental design and, um, how much of a change you can detect. So what's the power that your experiment can actually detect? Uh, and so, I mean, I think that's true of many areas, but social science seems to have thought an awful lot about statistics. Um, that doesn't mean that all that knowledge is directly transferable, but there, there is, because this is the only way to do sort of an experiment in the social sciences, right, is that you have to craft an experiment and and know that you have the right number of participants to, to observe a result if there is a, a difference. Um, then I think that there is a strong social, social, sorry, statistics background in the social sciences. So that's a great question. I'd never thought about it like it, that before. It, 
Right, and continuing with the interdisciplinary stakeholders mm. you interact with. Um, for example, you come from a chemistry science background and some and CS in your undergrad, so you're used to thinking of systems in terms of computation or chemistry. Do you get anything from folks like sociologists or economists who think about people and systems surrounding them and their interactions that that kind of sticks with you? Yeah. Like one or two things? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think in a lot of ways, people in molecules behave a lot alike in that um, in their individual sort of behaviors. Uh, uh, and I'm not a social scientist, so let's just, you know, take this with a grain of salt. But in their visual, individual behaviors, um, any individual molecule or person appears fairly random, right? They behave according to some distribution. Um, but in the whole, uh, you know, taken as a whole, a society or a group of people behave in a concerted, uh, um, you know, almost deterministic fashion, right? Um, so you get this emergent behavior of a whole of people, and I definitely see that in molecules, right? When you have one or two molecules, they be, they're like all doing weird things. But when you put them together, you get a liquid, right? Or you get a gas or you get um, a pharmaceutical lead. Um, and so I think that there, there are some interesting parallels in terms of how you think through the problems. Um, one of the things that I've taken away a lot in my work in um, chemical engineering data science from the social sciences has been networks. And so, you know, the analysis, for example, of Twitter, right? The, the network analyses that are coming out of the social sciences um, are incredibly useful for understanding the behavior of molecules and, and their interactions. Uh, molecules are themselves like little networks of atoms, um, but then they interact with each other in a fashion that's similar to a network, um, like a social network on Twitter. And then when you scale up to things like proteins, which are giant molecules in the body um, and nucleic acids like your DNA and stuff like that, um, they have their own networks. And you could scale it up even farther to microbiology. And one of my favorite research topics is trying to understand through network analysis um, how microbes in a community are interacting to achieve the emergent behaviors, like to achieve carbon cycling, to achieve... Um, what happens in your gut and how they make your, you sick. And so I think there are really tangible takeaways um, like network analysis that, that translates almost immediately over to, to biology and chemistry. Is it easier now to solve some of these problems given modern machine learning and cloud computing and the other tools that are made available oh, than totally. it used to be? I mean, the, the ecosystem of open source tools right now that is available to um, scientists is... Uh, you know, unparalleled in our history. Um, and I think, you know, R was uh, really a strong um, sort of uh, uh, gateway to many uh, ecologists and um, bio folks. Um, I happen to not have a very favorable view of R and what it's like to teach R, but we have to give a lot of credit to the R community for developing that ecosystem. And I think the same is true for Python. Like, you know, again, I have definitely used in my um, uh, work on microbes uh, code that came from ecologists uh, that was adapted from social scientists. And so that, that cross-fertilization, that code sharing, the richness of those ecosystems is totally transforming how we do things now. Um, really exciting. Is there a common journey for the scholars you work with when they discover the open source communities. And I'm wondering if if it's a contrast compared to academia where it's so competitive and everybody is trying to get a little bit of a pretty scarce pool of capital and opportunities. Um, you know, in many ways, uh, open data, excuse me, has been a thing in... Um, uh, science forever, right? You wrote a publication or, you know, you you constructed a manuscript or you were, um, you know, uh, Galileo taking your journal, your notes, and, and you share that with the community. So that's been a, the backbone of science is this concept of data sharing. And there will always be people who don't adhere to this and believe that there's some 
I don't know, selective advantage for them or that they're somehow doing them. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't necessarily get the mindset, but there, there are some folks that don't buy into that. Um, I think more recently, uh, there has been a perception of tension between the open source software and sort of an academic career. And that, um, by releasing your software, you're releasing a competitive advantage to people or, um, by releasing your software or focusing on creating the software that you're somehow distracting yourself from the ultimate goal of the, the science and engineering. And I think that that's, that's false. And that, um, one of the things that we can do, like the eScience Institute can do, the University of Washington that can do, uh, informed faculty around the country, is think through during promotion and tenure processes um, the, the actual value of open source, right? That um, releasing your open source software is sort of the ultimate in publishing and that you're saying, here's what I did to create this result and I'm giving it away to everyone, right? Um, and not only that, you can verify it. Right. You can take my code and you can run it again and make sure it gets the same result or you can run it on some new data and see if that result is consistent. And so this um, the reward structures around uh, uh, promotion and tenure sort of need to be reevaluated in the context of open source software being a value product in the same way a data set is a value product, the same way a patent is a value product or a publication is a value product. And so. I think that there is a perception of tension between, again, the open source and and sort of um, the the uh, publisher parish and uh, highly competitive nature of academia. But I think when you dig a little into that, um, that those two things really aren't uh, different from each other, and that we we just need to uh, sort of reevaluate the metrics on how we hire junior faculty, like. I would want to make sure that we hired your last guest. She was awesome, and she deserves to be a faculty member somewhere if she wants to be. And we need to, uh, uh, you know. Introductions okay. on the way. <laughs> I figured you guys would plug something in there. Um, we, we need to be thoughtful about, uh, you know, how we evaluate people and evaluate them that their data, their, their data, their software, their patents are just as valuable as their manuscripts. This, yeah, this has been very, very fantastic. This has been a great episode. Anything you would like to leave behind, uh, you know, with the audience, uh, maybe uh, how to contact you if you care, or you know, that they should attend UW or whatever it is that you would do. Um, I think the thing that I would encourage, um, you know, sort of everybody to do is to get out there and get informed and look for all the possible ways that you could sort of become a literate, um, you know, data literate individual. Um, and that's probably my, my big, you know, take a thing I want people to take away because it'll help you to, to recognize different disinformation. It'll help you to think about deep fakes. It'll help you be a better citizen, but also you can become a scientist or an engineer or an artist and, have these skills under your belt and I think your work will appeal to more people and have greater impact. So I don't know. That's that's my personal sort of thing that I give everybody when when we walk away is don't don't stop learning and never stop learning about data science.